Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top said, When I first saw Johnny perform, I was maybe 12 or 13, and he was known as Johnny Cool Daddy Winner, and we've always thought of him as exactly that, one cool daddy. Johnny became a dear and passionate friend, as well as the accomplished blues man we have come to admire. When Johnny picks up a guitar, you never quite know what's going to come at you. But whatever it is, it's going to be good. Now that sounds about right to me, and a good way to start this video. Johnny said he left the rock and roll to Edgar, and he just stuck to what was in his heart. Well, what came out was a style like no other. Definitely Delta Blues, with a hint of psychedelic rock and roll sprinkled in. So let's kick back and take a look back at how this blues man from Texas came to be. Johnny Winter. John Dawson Winter III was born in 1944 in Beaumont, Texas. His memory of Beaumont was there was a lot of bad smells the sulfur plant and the oil fields, but it was a pretty good place to grow up. Growing up, Johnny says it was real nice. He had great parents and they encouraged him and his brother to play music. His daddy played sax and banjo and taught him his first chords on the ukulele when he was about eight or nine years old. The first songs he learned to play was songs his daddy taught him, like Ain't She Sweet and five foot two. His first guitar was an acoustic he started playing at age 12, then quickly moved up to the electric. His first band, Johnny and the Jammers, consisted of his brother Edgar on piano, Willard Chamberlain on saxophone, Dennis Dugan on bass, and David Holliday on drums. Dennis Dugan said Johnny was a perfectionist even back then. Sometimes he wouldn't let me even turn up the volume on my amp. When Edgar wasn't playing the way Johnny wanted, he would walk over to him and whack Edgar with his guitar, and Edgar would holler, I'm going to tell Mom on you. Johnny made his first record at 15 years old. The first studio experience was unbelievable. I just loved it, he says. The studio was a funky little place with egg cartons on the wall. The name of the songs were called School Day Blues and You Know I Love You. Both were songs he had written and one went to number eight locally in Beaumont and sold 300 copies, he laughed. But to hear his songs playing on the radio was the best feeling ever, he recalled. As Johnny grew older and dove deeper into the blues, he found the clubs in Beaumont weren't hosting his favorite forms of music. The clubs were big on country music, he said. I could play the blues for white people, but they didn't want to hear it. Country music wasn't anything really close to what Johnny felt, although he did take a gig once playing bass for country singer George Jones. There was always a rootiness in Johnny's playing, but he felt less of a pull from the brassy Texas blues and more from the electric sound that migrated from the Mississippi Delta up to Chicago. That sound was the one that grabbed me, Johnny said. Johnny said he would frequent some of the black blues clubs around, but he said he first started listening to the blues on the radio and would buy any record he could. He said Edgar was rock and roll, but it was the blues for him. In late 1968, Rolling Stone magazine ran a cover story on music in Texas that referenced Johnny who at that point had one album to his credit, The Progressive Blues Experiment. 
but Columbia Records took notice and signed him to a lucrative contract. The next year, 1969, was a breakout one. Johnny lived a lifetime in 1969. In June, he released Johnny Winter. That album really captured the heart of his blues, with originals and electric takes on blues from the Delta, Robert Johnson's When You Got a Good Friend, and closer to home in Houston, Lightning Hopkins' Backdoor Friend. Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top had this to say about Johnny and his album. The impact was tremendous on musicians and fans alike. Johnny was exacting, authentic, and added his special something extra, something very out there, both in presentation and performance. I think that something extra and out there Billy was talking about is what set Johnny and his guitar style ahead above the rest. In August, in the early morning hours of the final day, he took the stage at Woodstock, and in many people's opinion, mine included, only the legendary Jimi Hendrix topped his performance during the festival. With a band consisting of his brother Edgar, bassist Tommy Shannon, and Uncle John Turner on the drums, it was a kick-ass and take-name performance that is still talked about today. He also starred a brief love affair with Janis Joplin in 1969. There's a live recording out there of them doing the song, Help Me Baby. It was recorded in Boston sometime in 69. It isn't great quality, but still Johnny's guitar playing is just out of sight on this one. I think you can still find this one on YouTube. I'll put a link in the description. Use some headphones and enjoy. The recording here really shows off his style a kind of a cross between that psychedelic rock and Delta blues. It's just amazing. Now most know Johnny had a drug problem and became addicted to heroin. After his friend Jimi Hendrix died from drugs and then Janis Joplin, Johnny finally decided to seek help. Here's what he had to say. It was very strange the way people treated me after getting real big. The way people treated me was weird being worshipped is not fun. Being appreciated is great, but being worshipped is not good. It was a lot of pressure. Everybody knew who I was. It was what I had wanted, so I couldn't complain. When I figured out I was addicted to heroin, I couldn't stand it. I wanted to die. So I checked myself into rehab and was there for nine months. Johnny said if he could change something in his life, it would be not to get on heroin. He said he got on heroin because he just wasn't feeling good about things and heroin made him feel better and he didn't care about stuff anymore. Johnny had a problem with all the fans coming around. Deep down, Johnny's a private person and once he made it big, that all changed and so did he. He goes on to say the first time he got some heroin was at a party in Los Angeles. He says, some guy gave it to me for free. Then he laughs, saying, that never happened again. But Johnny did kick the heroin habit by going to rehab for nine months. Back then there wasn't clinics like they have now and doctors didn't know a lot about treatment. I've never heard him say exactly what or how his treatments was done Although I do know Johnny was taking methadone most all of his life and his drinking increased a lot after the rehab. Johnny's album, Second Winter, was his second album to be released in late 1969 and was produced by Johnny himself. Although it didn't start out that way, Eddie Kramer, who produced Jimi Hendrix and the Stones and go on to produce Alice Cooper and Kiss, started out as producer, but Johnny fired him. Here's what Johnny had to say about that. He wasn't doing his job. He was outside the studio recording rainstorm sound effects. So we fired him midstream, leaving me and Edgar to finish the job of producing and recording the album. Johnny also spent a little time with Jimi Hendrix. When Johnny was in New York, there was a club all the players would go to, 
and Jimmy was there, and he invited Johnny to come to the studio he was at and jam some. Here's what Johnny had to say about it. He'd tape everything and listen to it the next day. I usually gave him the reins pretty much. I mostly played rhythm. But on the song we recorded, the things that I used to do, we traded off. I played slide guitar and he played regular guitar. It came out real well. I believe that was the only song that was recorded. I played with him about 10 times maybe and thought he was the best guitar player around. Speaking of slide, Johnny tried everything in the early years, but finally settled on a piece of what I heard him call a piece of conduit. Now usually conduit is used by electricians to run wire through and has a rough finish. It looks to me like he used a piece of pipe used in bathroom plumbing, but I might be wrong here. If anyone knows for sure, speak up. I do remember him saying he likes the slide to fit tight on his little finger, and he uses open D tuning, although I have heard him play in open G. And of course, he uses his trademark thumb pick, never a straight pick. I heard him say he started using the thumb pick because of Chet Atkins and Merle Travis' style of playing. I would guess you could spend all day talking about the musicians Johnny has done shows with, jammed with, recorded in the studio with, and produced their music. But the one that really stands out is Muddy Waters. Johnny took Muddy into the studio and produced his album, Hard Again, which was released in January of 1977. It brought Muddy Waters back to the light again. The album won the Grammy Award for Best Ethnic or Traditional Folk Recording. Then the following year, Muddy was back in the studio again with Johnny producing the I'm Ready album. And again, it won Muddy another Grammy. They did get together one last time in 1980 and try to get the King Bee album going. But by then, Muddy's health was failing. Johnny wasn't real happy with the results and it took them a while to actually get the album put together. Muddy was to die a few years later Johnny was given a lot of well-deserved credit for reviving Muddy's career. They became very close and their relationship at the end was almost like a father and son. Muddy passed away of a heart attack on April 30th, 1983. As fate would have it, Johnny was to meet someone at just about the same point in his life. That was guitarist producer Paul Nelson I'll put a link up here to Paul's website. It has all of his social media pages listed if you want to check him out. Paul took over managing after Johnny fired his manager, who had him pretty much mired down. Johnny wasn't in very good shape at the time. I read he was down to 90 pounds. Now, I know Johnny was always skinny, but 90 pounds is crazy. He had been on methadone for over 30 years, drank heavily, and smoked cools all the time. Paul got him cleaned up and playing and singing good again. Paul was a true friend to Johnny and he really cared about him. Here's a few things Paul had to say about Johnny. He describes him as a blues icon. He says the funniest story you ever heard about Johnny, and this is a good one. He was on a plane and went to the bathroom. He was extremely drunk. When he came out of the bathroom, he yelled to everyone on the plane, what is everyone doing on my tour bus? Paul said that story always makes him laugh. He goes on to say, I was sitting in the studio with Johnny recording for the last time, which was his Grammy winning Step Back album, and him saying to me, if we don't get a Grammy for this album, the Recording Academy is nuts. And then being able to say with pride to everyone, Yes, we did win the Grammy. Unfortunately, Johnny wasn't here to share it, but he would have been so proud and happy. Somehow I do believe he knows he won the Grammy and he is happy about it. I myself believe Johnny Winter could have been the big time rock star in the 70s had he wanted to. His fourth album, Johnny Winter and, was released in 1970. Besides Johnny, the group included guitarist Rick Derringer, bassist Randy Hobbs, and drummer Randy Zeringer, 
all former members of the McCoys. The album was produced by Johnny and Rick Derringer and was a very good album and sold well. Funny thing is, Johnny said this was his least favorite album he ever did. It was probably a little too commercial and rock and roll for him. Johnny could rock with the best of them, but his heart was in the blues and stayed there till the day he died. I'll leave you all with this, another quote from Paul Nelson. What was the best advice anyone ever gave you? Johnny told me I should stay true to myself and to my music, which I have done. Johnny was my friend, confidant, and role model. Johnny stayed true to himself and to his music throughout his life, and I have learned to do the same. Johnny has been one of the greatest influences in my life, both personally and professionally. I miss him very much. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If so, and you see fit, give us a like, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel.